Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Can 3D printed life-size organ models help to map out complex surgeries ahead of time? Is it possible? It already is right here. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is my friend. And when we were kids, we bought baseball cards because of the gum. Here is the cap. Yeah, there's nothing better than a hard stick of stale gum. It's good to be seen. Good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today I am excited because this week we are featuring Ash Chill Hazy IPA by the adventurous folks over at Sweeten Creek Brewing. This is a delightfully soft-bodied and juicy hazy IPA with tropical fruity flavors and aroma. Enjoy one of these exceptionally drinkable IPAs on your next big adventure. And here's a toast to some of our friends who are just amazing. First up, a cheers to Mary in Scarsdale, New York. And a big shout out to Elizabeth in Colleyville, Texas. And last but certainly not least, we have a shout out to Janelle B., our friend and a fire medic. So cheers to Janelle and all of the first responders out there. Everyone we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com, clicked on the donate button, told us what city they're in, and we are shouting you out. Thank you all for helping out with this week's beer run. Yeah, B W E W R U N beer run. Make sure you check your email because we sent out some emails with promo codes celebrating 600 episodes of our nasally drones. And Colonel, that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Chris Thompson worked for a man named Michael Short. Michael was the owner of a company called MS Mobile Home Movers. MS, of course, stands for Michael Short. The mobile home movers part means just what it says. If you have a mobile home that you need moved, well then Michael Short and his team are the people to call. So Michael and Chris worked together. And with a team of day laborers, They specialized in lifting those prefab trailer homes off their foundations, placing them on special flatbeds, and transporting them to new locations. We have all seen the oversized loads traveling on America's highways. Now, on Thursday, August 15th, 2002, Chris was supposed to accompany Michael on a trip to purchase another truck. So on that morning, Chris was to meet Michael at Michael's house first thing. Chris had been to his boss's home many times for work, including for several hours on the evening before, helping Michael repair one of those large trucks the business used. 
Chris pulled into the driveway of Michael's red brick home on Route 220 in the Oak Level neighborhood of Bassett, Virginia, around 9 a.m., and parked his car. To Chris's surprise, when he pulled up to the house that Michael shared with his family, Michael wasn't waiting for him outside. No, in fact, no one was outside. It was quiet. Chris got out of his car and spotted the garage door was open. So he approached. There in the garage, he found Michael Short. Michael was a large man. And Chris could see he was lying on his back on an old floral couch inside a garage that Michael used as a sort of man cave with a TV and all. The garage door was open, and Chris could see in right from where he was standing, from the driveway. But it was only when he walked closer to Michael that he could see that there was a problem. Michael looked like he was asleep, but unfortunately, he was not. Chris was horrified. He can now see a gaping gunshot wound to Michael's head. Chris was quick to call police. Henry County deputies raced to the short home and swarmed the place. They entered the deathly quiet house, guns drawn. Soon, they found Michael's wife, Mary, in the master bedroom. She, too, was lying down, having been shot in the couple's bed. She, too was dead. Authorities confirmed that Michael and Mary were killed. This was not a murder-suicide. The sheriff's department stated someone else had shot these two people, presumably as they slept. The couple were each shot once with a 22 caliber gun. The murder weapon was not found at the scene, and more importantly, Something else was missing from the scene. The couple's nine-year-old daughter, Jennifer. Who killed this well-liked and hard-working married couple? And where was their nine-year-old daughter? This is True Crime Garage. Michael, Mary, and their daughter Jennifer Short were a wonderful little family of three. The community of Henry County, Virginia, was absolutely wrecked by this case. And this is a unique case. They all are, but this is an unusual case for investigators. Most detectives will work a very long career and never have to investigate something like this. A double homicide followed by the abduction of the couple's little girl. We said the community was wrecked, and that was very true, but not just wrecked, puzzled would be another great word to describe the situation. That's because everyone was having an incredibly difficult time trying to figure out just what happened, and of all of the possibilities, why did this happen? What was the motive here? The Short family were universally described as a close family who did a lot together. Jennifer was a fairly shy little girl, always attached to one of her parents. Photos of her show an adorable, all-American-looking, freckled girl with a toothy smile and brown hair. Jennifer loved to play Barbies, softball, and dance. She was looking forward to starting the fourth grade. The school secretary, Tammy Joyce, said Jennifer is a precious little girl and a role model student. Mary worked at a factory for a time, but when she died, she was doing the books for Michael's moving business. So both of them working for Michael's company. Michael operated his business. He was a hard worker, committed to his family, and that was pretty much that when it came to the short family. Michael's sister, Carolyn Short, said the couple was very happy and kept to themselves. Mary Short's brother-in-law, Thomas Lynch, told the Associated Press they were good people. 
and he was completely stunned by what had happened. Let's start our investigation here, Captain. We will get into some details about the timeline, the location, and the actual investigation as well. Okay. The night before the murders, the Shorts seemed to have spent a quiet night together as a family. They were seen getting dinner at a local Burger King drive through By some reports, quite late. They have them there as late as 11 p.m. Now, keep in mind, at some point that evening, we have Michael Short, who is working with his employee, Chris Thompson, at their home, working on getting a truck ready to go for the next day. So we have people that see them through the drive through or going through the drive through at Burger King around 11 p.m., and then they're going to head home, obviously, to eat their dinner. Yes, after the trip to that local Burger King, the family apparently went home, and as said, it was quite late that night, so they would have went to bed shortly after that. That's the last point that we know anything about their life other than the discovery of their bodies the next morning. That is according to the now Sheriff Lane Perry, what he has said in some interviews. The details of what happened later are still unknown, really, to this day. All we know is that after that trip to Burger King at approximately 11 p.m., that at 9 a.m., two of them were dead and one of them were missing. The short residence, their home, was located on US 220, 35 miles south of Roanoke, Virginia. This is in Henry County. The home sat on a busy four-lane highway surrounded by seedy motels and gas stations. There was a Circle C convenience store and also a Circle C motel that were, some people call them next door to the short family home. By some reports, they have these two locations being approximately 100 yards away. The shorts were at the convenience store very often, buying snacks, drinks, and gasoline. Jennifer, the little girl, was the one who would go in and pay. And she made friends with the owner, which is Lorraine St. Clair. The closest neighbor to the Short family lived 300 feet away, but very few residents were in the area. So basically the length of a football field. One neighbor, Ruby Eberson, told newspapers there was no sign of any trouble with the family. They were always outside. They were always outdoors together in the yard. They seemed as happy as could be. Across from the Shorts' house was a flea market and a junkyard, and on the side next to the Circle C was an abandoned farm stand. It was a fairly rural area, and if you want to look this up on any maps, you will see just that. This is mostly lower-income families in this general area just trying to eke out a living. The Sheriff's Department was quick to state that they were certain that Jennifer's bed had been slept in, saying the covers were pulled back as if she had been in bed and then thrown back the covers to get up. And that's what Henry County Sheriff's Captain Kimmy Nestor said. They assumed at first Jennifer had been awakened by the sounds of the gun blast and had been terrified. She probably crept out of the house and was hiding somewhere. So this is their early suspicions, right? We find both Mother and father killed at the home, presumably as they slept. We have the father who's found in the garage area of the home. We have the mother, Mary Short, who is found in the master bedroom. And then we have the daughter, nine-year-old Jennifer Short. Her bed appears that she slept in it the night before, and she is missing from the scene. The sheriff's department is saying, look, we think what happened here is that we have both parents having been shot, The little girl must have heard something and she snuck out of the house and she's probably hiding for safety and waiting to come out at some point when she knows that it is safe to come out of hiding. We've actually seen this in some other cases. So it's interesting that they are looking at that as a possibility very early on in the case. A couple of things that are of interest to me here, Captain, is one, we got the father who is in the garage, and then we have the mother found in the master bedroom. There doesn't appear to be, based off of any of the neighbors or family members' statements, that there was any kind of issue between mom and dad during this time, that there was any kind of 
fighting or that they weren't getting along. In fact, it was said that Michael, it wasn't uncommon for him to sleep in the garage. And some of these occasions, it sounds like it was happenstance that he didn't purposely sleep in the garage on the couch, but often would be out there watching TV and would simply fall asleep on the couch and end up staying the night there. A little pin in this in the information is that we have three victims in there in three different locations. And not only that, one thing that's incredibly curious here that we don't have a definitive answer on is remember when Michael Short's employee, Christopher Thompson, arrives that morning at roughly 9 a.m. and finds Michael Short killed in the garage, Chris states that when he arrived, the garage door was open. So we don't know, could this be a situation where Michael Short fell asleep on the couch, accidentally left the garage door open? This is the middle of the summer, southern Virginia. It's going to be warm out. They also said that it wasn't uncommon for him to sleep out there on warmer nights. And so you wonder, did he happen to leave this garage door open or did the killer, for whatever reason, leave the garage door open after fleeing the home? And if you're in law enforcement, you're going to want to know when Chris Thompson got there the day before and what time he left and then what time he arrived the next day because he's the last person seen with the family and he's the person that found the family. Yes, and we will continue to take a look at Chris Thompson throughout our coverage of this week's uh, case. But one thing that's interesting to me is think about how complicated this situation is immediately for the sheriff's department, right? You immediately have several different intense situations going on all at once, right? You have a crime scene that you have to secure. You have to start looking through the crime scene of this double homicide to collect evidence, to try to figure out what happened. But at the same time, you have a missing little girl that you have to look for. And until you have evidence to suggest to you that she might have been killed or something terrible has happened to her, you have to investigate it as if she is alive and you're hoping to find her alive and well. And you also have a witness, Chris Thompson, who arrived there at the scene that morning at 9 a.m. So right away, police are instantly thrust into the situation where they have a lot of stuff going on. We have a little girl that we need to find. We have this house that we need to secure. We have an investigation that we need to kick off. And so immediately we have about 25 deputies on the scene fanning out across the Shorts family property and the hills behind the home. And they're looking for this little girl. Unfortunately, there was no sign of Jennifer and she did not respond to any of their calls while they're out there looking for her. At only nine years old, the police didn't think that she would have gotten very far on her own. Now, relatives of the Shorts who lived nearby and quickly heard about the shootings, they show up at the scene. Unfortunately, these relatives knew nothing about where Jennifer could be, had no idea why this would have happened to Michael and Mary Short. Well, and if you don't find her in the immediate area, you start thinking, well, she's maybe she was kidnapped. And if she was, is this the motivation for killing the parents? Yeah, by early afternoon... With the girl not showing up, authorities started to lean toward a different theory. And as you said, Captain, it's the another bad theory here. Jennifer was the victim of an abduction. That's the theory that they started working that afternoon. Some evidence at the scene helped them to come to this conclusion. And that evidence is Jennifer's mattress was moved. Her bed was moved approximately two inches and her pillow was on the floor so this might suggest some sign of a struggle in her room. But more significantly, the phone lines to the home, the phone lines outside of the house had been cut. Yeah. So if there were anyone, and I don't think that there, there were anyone on the scene, but you also have to keep in mind there is a possibility that Jennifer shot both of her parents in their sleep and then left the home 
that's got to be on your mind when you're at the scene and you're taking a look at that scene. Now, of course, these other items are going to suggest to you that that is not what happened. A little girl does not go outside and cut the phone lines, kill her parents, and then flee the scene. Yeah, it's a level of sophistication for sure. And then to maybe have a better understanding, do we know, like, was her father found laying on the couch? Was her mother found laying in her bed? Yes, that's correct. Father on the couch, mother on the bed. See, that's, a to me, another, another level of sophistication in this case is you almost think that this murderer would have known where they would sleep. And so you'd have to have some knowledge of this family to know that the the husband sleeps in the garage on a couch sometimes. Possibly. But if you also have the wandering psychopath who observes a garage door open at 2 a.m. and just approaches the house, you could have a completely different situation. Yeah, very good point. Now, the thing here is, again, now no suspicion as to the, the daughter being involved in any manner other than we think, oh, no, my God, she, she may have been abducted right. after this, this went down. So the police urgently needing to find Jennifer, they issued an Amber alert And Captain Nestor, at the time, he says, nobody knows where this child is. That's not normal. He is right. That is not normal. This is a very bizarre situation. But Jennifer's whereabouts was just one of many puzzling questions plaguing this case. In the wake of the Amber Alert, a massive search effort was launched to find Jennifer. A command center was set up outside of the home to coordinate the search parties and serve as a central location. According to the local papers, searches included dogs, helicopters, ATVs, horses, boats, dredging nearby ponds, and grid searches by deputies on foot. Scent dogs alerted to Jennifer at several different locations, Uh, of course at the home, at the motel, and at the convenience store, again, these places located next door. Right. The problem with this is these three places obviously are places that Jennifer frequented, and some say almost on a daily basis. So the police did not consider these hits by the dogs significant for that reason. They actually expected the dogs to hit at these three different locations. Searches extended on to Friday. By this time, Captain, we have, we're calling out all the stops, right? We, we have so many different agencies involved. We have the FBI, state police, and troopers from North Carolina State Police involved as well, and there's still no sign of Jennifer Short. Canvases of the neighborhoods turned up very little, And no one at the Circle C Motel next door seemed suspicious, despite the fact that this was a known gathering spot for transients and drug addicts, this according to the Daily Press. By Friday afternoon, police said they were sure that Jennifer was not anywhere in the immediate area. Frustrated sheriffs, and we should be clear here, there were two head sheriffs involved in this case, and that is because... The Shorts, that family, they lived very close to the Henry and Franklin County line. So we have both sheriffs involved, and they are up front and center, and they are frustrated because they, A, can't find this little girl, but B, they also say, at this time, we have no suspects. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. 
It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. All right, we are back. Cheers, mates. Cheers to you, Colonel. Cheers to you, Captain. Well, unfortunately, the search and rescue team called it quits on Saturday. Now, keep in mind, the discovery of the dead parents takes place on Thursday, August 15th, 2002. We have searched for this little girl in the immediate area for a little over 48 hours before they call it quits. Well, and I just want to disagree with you when when you said that they had no suspects that's probably what they stated but we have to assume that chris is at the top of their early suspect list well i think suspect is a tricky word right of course anybody that finds the homicide victim anybody that was last seen with a homicide victim right those are always people of uh, persons of interest and if you want to call them suspects, you can. I think that you need a little more than, oh, this person just happened to be with them. These are people that they are, of course, you're 100% actively looking at, vetting their story, trying to figure out, do we make them a suspect? But what we have here is, at least on the public level, they weren't willing to state that they had any suspects and not necessarily specifically name anybody for the papers, just saying we don't have any any suspects, which is quite unfortunate because you feel like this is very early on in their investigation. You wonder how quickly these leads are drying up if they had any at all to begin with. And now you're left with this situation of, well, we really need to find this little girl, one, because we hope that she is alive and well, but two, she's now a big part of our investigation. Whatever happened to her might lead us to the persons responsible for this homicides, but also help us understand what the motivation was, what the motive was for right. any of this mess at all. What well, also makes you question some things too, like as far as eyewitnesses go, because we have this big, we have a house with a garage door. And did anybody see what time this garage door was shut or did they see, did they come out of their house at 3 a.m. because they heard something or they went outside to smoke and then saw the garage door was still open? Because I, I would assume, I mean, it's 22, so it's not going to be super loud, but it's still gunshots in, in a garage. You'd think that echo and maybe a, a neighbor would hear something. So maybe we don't have an eyewitness, but we have an ear witness. Yeah, we don't have anybody that's telling us or leading us at this point in this direction of where we should be looking. In fact, what we have is the uh, the chief of the search and rescue team saying, we need to keep looking, but we realistically and logically putting all of the evidence together over the past couple of days, 
we don't have a direction to look in. And of course, he's talking about looking for the little girl, but you almost feel like that carries over to their thoughts on who could have killed the parents. Because if you're, if you're working the case, and again, they've not released a ton of stuff. We're coming up on 20 years. Next week will be 20 years since this double homicide. And we don't have a lot of information that's been released publicly, especially at the time. And, and we need to keep in mind, we're going to go through this point by point here. But what you're going to see is, especially early on, police were incredibly vague and quiet about what it was that they were seeing at the scene, what their theories and suspicions were, because the little girl's still miss- missing. And right now in our investigation, that is your number one goal to get her back, to retrieve her alive and well. And so they are purposely keeping things vague and keeping things quiet with the idea that whoever took her may be following the case, maybe keeping an eye on the situation. We don't want that person to panic and kill this little girl. Right. The other thing that was popular back then that's not really popular now that I wonder if they would question is you you probably have a newspaper boy. So your newspapers are going to be coming between, I don't know, safely, let's say 5.30 to 7 o'clock. Did, did, did their local paper boy see anything? Well, I again, I would recommend that people look up their – home on a map because if there's a kid riding his bicycle to deliver a newspaper to their house, (laughs) I would be incredibly surprised. Uh, Their closest neighbor was about 300 feet or so from their home. And if you're working this case and you're thinking that, oh, we're seeing evidence here that both of the parents were still asleep when they were shot and killed. We don't know who was shot and killed first. Right. But if Mary was asleep in the master bedroom and did not hear her husband being shot on the couch in the garage, well, then those neighbors 300 feet away or further, they didn't hear anything either. And the, this situation is, is weird because again, I don't want to, I don't want to circle in on this idea that it was some total and complete random stranger here, but we're talking about, they live on a highway. They live on an actual highway. It's highway 220, and they don't have any very close neighbors. There's a, it's a four lane road. There's enough traffic on this highway that even in this little area, this little pocket that they live in this Oak level, Virginia, a a, a town that's so small that most people have never heard of it. There's still four lanes, two traveling north and two traveling southbound ish. And so we're talking about a, a, a well-traveled highway and not a whole lot of people living off of this highway. Now back to the crime scene, we have crime scene techs who are combing the house. This after of course that it was secured, they find no evidence that Jennifer was harmed when she was taken You know, we don't have any blood at the scene. All we have is what may appear to be some kind of scuffle that may have taken place in her bedroom. Now we have the police captain who tells the media that he believed that Jennifer was grabbed and abducted very quickly. We have Henry County Sheriff Frank Cassell that said that they believe Jennifer was taken from her bed and that her parents had been asleep when they were each shot. As we said, the murder weapon was not found at the home, but a shotgun and a rifle were found. These were removed from the scene and they belong to the shorts and evidently were not the murder weapon. Both Michael and Mary were killed with a single shot to the head. Photos show them both lying as if they were still asleep. It's pretty clear that they were sound asleep when they were killed is a, is a statement released by one of the officers. The thinking is that they were in totally separate parts of the house. So the sound of the 22 
firing into one of the victims would not have woke up the other one. Right. And in regard to the location of each parent when shot and killed, again, it it sounds like it was commonplace that Michael would sleep out in the garage on hot summer nights. There's also people that stated that his snoring would keep his wife up, and so sometimes he would simply sleep out there to appease her, to, to let her get a good night's sleep. What we don't know is whether he just left the overhead garage door open for fresh air or if the killer left the overhead garage door open after entering the home another way, killing the two victims, presumably taking Jennifer with him or with them, and then leaving the garage door open. Obviously, it's tough to know for certain, but I think with the phone lines being cut, I lean towards it not just being a crime of opportunity because the garage door was open. Yeah, it's a weird situation. The the cutting of the phone lines to me indicates more of the idea that I'm probably going to kill somebody or do something very horrible once I go into this home. Right. That that's what it kind of points out to me here. Now, we also have to wonder there's no mention of any type of forced entry into the home. And that's why I kind of keep circling around this idea about the garage door maybe possibly still being left open. We know that we had that as a strong suspicion. In fact, some neighbors stating that that was actually fact in the Aurora Hammer Slayer case. But here, let's move past the garage door, Captain. We have to wonder, did the killer have access to the home somehow? Or would the killer have gained access through an unlocked door or unlocked window? Um, again, no mention of forced entry at any time throughout the 20 years of this investigation in this case. Now we do have a statement from someone who knew the shorts that said it doesn't appear that they locked up very much, that they were concerned about, uh, keeping close tabs on whether doors and windows were locked or maybe even garage door shut at night. Well, my gut is telling me with the the phone lines being cut, my gut is saying that this is, again, a higher level of sophistication, almost like this was planned out. Well, what we can surmise from the situation is two things. We don't know who's responsible. We don't know what the motive was, but it appears to me murder weapon not found at the scene. They removed two of the shorts guns, and so we know that those guns were not used at the scene. We know that the phone lines were cut. So regardless of how the killer or killers entered the home, two things happened that they were prepared to do. One, kill some of the occupants of the home. They brought a gun with them to the scene. And two, they brought some kind of instrument with them to cut the phone lines to the house. So whoever did this, they showed up prepared for whatever it was that they intended to do. Now, at this point in our timeline, Captain, we have Jennifer who's been missing for about a week and the hunt for her had just run into brick wall after brick wall by this point. And so we have a family member, her aunt, that resorted to making a public plea, this to Jennifer's abductor, a public plea to bring the little girl home. Ruby Young was Mary Short's sister. Her husband, Chris Young, was a deputy for the Henry County Sheriff's Office. So not just because they're family, but he's working for the Sheriff's Office. They know and fully understand just how bad this whole situation is. And in fact, Chris Young had the unbelievable task of telling Mary and Michael's families that they were killed and that Jennifer was missing when this case first broke the Virginia investigators worked around the clock for several weeks looking for little Jennifer Sheriff Cassell said to the daily press you can't rest knowing there's a child out there the deputies were obsessed with finding the missing little girl and everyone held out hope that she was still alive friends family and acquaintances of Michael Mary and Jennifer Short were interviewed and looked at, and law enforcement were running down leads. These were leads that were brought in on a national level. 
So now we have leads outside of their county. And of course, these were brought in on a national level by the Amber Alert that was placed looking for Jennifer Short. Closer to home, police put Chris Thompson, the guy who found the bodies, through routine questioning and more. He was brought back in a number of times for follow-up interviews, but police said he was cooperating and was not considered a suspect. They started digging into the Short's life, their f- the family life, to see if there was anyone who might have had beef against them. Family members like Ruby Young, Mary's sister, and Daniel Hall, Mary's brother, told the media that, quote, we just can't make heads or tails of it, end quote. No one could think of any enemies the couple had, any drama or any feuds or unsettled scores that, that the Short family had. Captain Nestor commented, we were just trying to get a handle on who Short's business associates were, find out if he had any disgruntled people he was working with. And they even had the Secret Service that sent Spanish-speaking personnel to go and question some former employees of Michael's mobile home business. With him owning his own business, you'd think maybe the motive is money. But looking into their financials, they were kind of hurting for money. Yeah, it's very weird here, Captain, because you have to wonder, and you always have to wonder in these types of investigations, what was going on in this family's life? What is different about today, this week, or this month, or this year that was different than the other days, weeks, months, and years when everything was fine, when something this horrific didn't happen? And to me, sitting here from, you know, 30,000 feet above the situation, looking down, I'm wondering if there was actually a lot going on with this family at the time. And one of it being that two things. So it appears that they were kicking the tires on moving and two, that they were, that Michael short, the business owner was kicking the tires on moving his business eventually as well. And so the way that that goes is that on August 5th, now remember their bodies were found on August 15th. So about 10 days prior The Shorts had started working with a local realtor. This is uh, Marlene Dalton. And this was to list their home. Their home was listed. It was for sale at the time of their murders. Michael had told the realtor that business was slow and that they planned to move into their own trailer home. They had a trailer of their own that they were going to move into. And they thought that they would live there for some time and save up some money till they get back on their feet. Now, according to investigators for some months prior to the murders, Michael had considered moving his family and his business to another state to South Carolina. And he had done some recon in some towns there to get a feel for whether his business would thrive there or not. Apparently he had some business ties to South Carolina, and there was reason for him to believe that he could generate quite a bit more business in this area, that things were kind of drying up where they were. Business was once good. Now he just doesn't have as many customers as he used to have. Now, we do know that the real estate agent that they hired hosted at least one open house that we could find reference to. And we're simply throwing this out there and underlining that idea and that thought because, look, if somebody was planning something terrible and had been planning it for quite some time, if somebody wanted to familiarize themselves with the Shorts family home, with the inside layout of that home, well, an open house would be an easy and somewhat anonymous way to do so right so anybody that wanted to could have toured that home shortly before michael and mary were killed and like you were saying earlier law enforcement was hoping that the little girl gets scared because she hears gunshots and she's hiding in the woods but it's eight days later and 
there is no sign of the little girl. Again, it makes me wonder what the heck the motive was here. You start you start thinking by this point, at least I would be thinking that maybe Jennifer was the target all along, that maybe the abduction was the purpose of the homicides. Because, look, I could see a situation where let's say somebody has a problem with Michael Short. And look, people, whether they're successful in business, and we know he was at one time, or not successful, and he was, you know, the business was drying up toward the time that he was killed. Whether business is good, great, or or neither here nor there, it's easy to create enemies when you own your own business, when you're in business for yourself. And he had employees over the years. Could he have upset somebody? Could he have upset the wrong person, somebody that's got a few screws loose? Right. And you wonder, is there a situation where somebody has a score to settle with Michael Short, thinks that, you know what, I might have to silence his wife if he has one or should she be home. But you wonder, could there be a situation where the killer is just surprised that there was a little kid here? I didn't intend on doing something bad to a little kid. Uh, Maybe I'll take the kid and figure things out later. Right. And so you're hoping at this point, like you said, Captain, either she's in hiding and would come out probably hours after feeling like it was safe to come out. Or at this point, you're wondering, well, if somebody took her just because they panicked and didn't know what to do, you're hoping they would have dropped her off or released her by this point. But now you're eight days in. She's still missing. This is August 23rd. Sheriff Cassell tells the Daily Press, we have no suspects. Cassell goes on to say that he believed that the killer or killers knew the family, but admitted they didn't have a clear profile of the person who would kill the shorts and abduct a nine-year-old girl. And he also acknowledged that they didn't even know what motivated the crime. Was it a beef with one of the parents or was someone targeting Jennifer all along? Yeah, where's the beef? One thing that was very puzzling was that we would learn that robbery was clearly not an OT, not the motive. And the sheriff's office is saying this is because a bag, you know, you can't, you can't write this stuff, right? You say, well, it's not like there was a bag of money just sitting there. Well, in this case, there was a bag of money. Some moolah. A bag containing $485 in cash that was, that was sitting in plain sight on a kitchen counter. <laughs> this was not touched. There was also a $211 check that was sitting in plain sight in the kitchen as well. The check was not touched. So someone cuts the phone lines, shoots and kills Michael and Mary, and takes Jennifer, and all of this, whatever it was, went down for clearly a different purpose. Well, and the father being in a different location, being in the garage, mother being in their room. But I I thought that was weirder at first. But talking with law enforcement, they're like, well, both of them were where they would sleep at normally. So they basically were attacked where they'd sleep at. Yeah, and I also think that the cutting of the phone lines indicates to me that the person likely didn't just happen to see the garage door open. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Right. Like I, to me that, that shows me that they're, they're concerned of somebody calling for help. Where as if somebody just saw the garage door open and saw some type of opportunity, you would, that, that to me seems a little more impulsive where the cutting of the phone line seems 180 80 degrees in a different direction of impulsive. And if, you, if you're just there on an impulsive crime, why not take the bag of money? It, it's, it's all very weird to me because the cutting of the phone lines means you, you want to set up a scenario where they, a person cannot call for help that you are there to carry something out, but you're also the bag of money being found in the kitchen tells me that maybe they didn't want to be in the house very long either. Right. Which, as you said, you're using a loud weapon, a gun. You wouldn't want to stick around for very long after firing those shots. This 
sadly, all points to me that that very likely Jennifer may have been the motivating factor here in this this attack, this this home invasion. Mm-hmm. Now, we do get the FBI, we mentioned them already, but they are assisting in not just looking for the little girl, but they're also assisting in the investigation as well. And one thing that they did early on was preparing a list of behaviors and providing that list to the local authorities. This is a list of behaviors that might be indicative of a suspect in that crime and this crime specifically. And they are saying that the behaviors include a hasty departure from the area, changes in habits, especially an increase in drinking or smoking, an unnatural interest in publicity about the case, or changes in facial hair or haircut. So basically saying whoever did this, we would expect to see that they would want to change their appearance in some form or fashion, that they would likely want to leave this general area and get out of Dodge. And oh, by the way, they may increase their drinking and or smoking habits in the process. Meanwhile, in the meanwhile, summer break is going to end. Yes. For kids in the area, right? We, we are now well into August And so summer break ends for other boys and little girls in Jennifer's fourth grade class Mm -hmm. at Figsboro Elementary. Her teacher vows to keep a desk for Jennifer with her name on it. And this is so that she has a desk to come back to when she is found and returned to her extended family that, again, still lives in the area. Michael and Mary were buried after a somber, well-attended funeral. The family was sad and distracted by the knowledge that Jennifer was still out there somewhere, still missing. Nobody knows where she is. Police filmed, this is very smart, police filmed the entire proceedings of the funeral, hoping that some person might stand out, right? There might be somebody there exhibiting strange behavior that maybe this would lead them to the killer. But if they saw anything that they thought was strange, we are not ever made aware of that. We being the public. So it appears that either that didn't happen or they spotted something, investigated it and found out that it was nothing of great concern. Right. The sheriff's office was, as said, very tight lipped about what forensic evidence was found at the murder scene. Remember that we said that the house was on the market at the time it was listed for sale We have Lieutenant Curtis Spence of the Henry County Sheriff's Office who told Fox 8 News the house was up for sale and it looked like a show place. You could have put it in a magazine. There was nothing out of place inside the house. I stayed in that house for over two weeks myself just collecting evidence. We fingerprinted everything you can think of, including the walls, end quote. That quote to me is very interesting. Right. Because when we first reviewed what they said they were finding in Jennifer's room, this somewhat subtle disturbance in Jennifer's room, that seemed to me like a big question mark. Like, why are they honing in on this? This seems too subtle. Right. But we have law enforcement on record saying the place looked like a show place, looked like it was ready to be fil- you know, filmed or photographed for a magazine. Well, yeah, because they're trying to sell it. Correct. And that might be why these items stood out so well to police with the bed being moved just a couple of inches right? and the bed being unmade and unkept. So it looked to them that whatever happened, whatever went down with Jennifer went down in her room based off of what they were finding. Investigators also didn't disclose whether Mary and Michael were shot with the same gun. Um, and they didn't really address Yeah, they really didn't address the murder weapon at all. We do know that it was uh, two. Well, we believe that the gun was a twenty-two. Yes, and and we have evidence backing up that. Uh, The detectives also didn't address whether there was forced entry to the home. They don't address whether neighbors heard the shots, whether shell, shell casings were found, whether there was any finger or shoe prints found at the scene. So they're not really addressing anything, but we kind of get some uh, kind of a, a back alley 
information, right? We, we, we can sidestep law enforcement and get some information on this case. And that is finding answers about the crime scene and the evidence because of the gangbusters work done by Fox eight news. So they did a whole series on the case. And one thing that they featured in their coverage was search warrants and affidavits that were reviewed by Fox eight news and based off of the search warrants and the information therein, we learned that detectives took 138 items from the shorts home. And this included two, one, two, 22 caliber bullet shell casings found near the bodies of Michael and Mary short who were each shot once. We know that they took a 22 caliber shotgun and a rifle and ammunition from the home and the cash in a bag that was found on the kitchen table. They also reportedly collected fingerprints and hair or hairs that are from an unidentified person or persons. There were reports early on that there was a note found on the kitchen table and a finger writing on one of the windows that read, I'm glad to see. But this last bit has not been verified and has not been reported in the past several years. So these are reports that we found early on from years ago. In regard to the note that may have been found on the kitchen table, my understanding, Captain, is that that was sent off to the FBI for for handwriting analysis. I don't know what that note said. Again, both of these items, while they're reported early on, they're never reported again for several years uh, up to this date that we're recording here in the garage today. So I question the the validity of these two items if they're more rumor than, than truth, or it would appear that if there is anything significant about either one of these items, that police are either holding that very close to the vest, or there's nothing significant about either one of these items. We have a family of three, the, the father found dead in the garage, the mother found dead in her bed, their nine-year-old daughter missing. We have the phone lines being cut. What other evidence do we have? So this is very interesting to me as well. This is another piece of potential, potential evidence that was collected. And we know that this was collected based off of a report by the Roanoke times. And they're reporting this on August 22nd. And their report states investigators on a double homicide and kidnapping in Henry County have seized an answering machine tape from the home of victims Michael and Mary Short and sent it to the FBI for analysis because it appears to contain an obscene message, according to law enforcement sources close to the investigation. It was difficult for deputies to distinguish the words on the tape, the sources said. Police hope the FBI can enhance it and make the message more intelligible. If they did make heads or tails of this message, if they believe that it was related to the case, unfortunately for our investigation here in the garage today, they've not said so. So we know they took this in. We know that they sent it off for analysis in the vague description we get is that it may have been an obscene message that the police were not able to make out the entirety of the message. Right. So we know some stuff, right? But not much, not a ton. Like, for instance, we know that the shorts were each shot once, but we don't even know whether the shorts were shot with the same gun. The police said early on that no weapon was found at the scene. So it appears that the guns that were taken into evidence might have been those just owned by the family. And the killer or killers brought his own gun or guns to the home that night. We also don't know what kind of implement was used to cut the phone lines or how the killer found those in the dark of night. One thing that investigators seemed to agree on though, was that he or they definitely came to the murder scene prepared. Well, good job, Sherlock Holmes. Now this is interesting 
Sheriff Cassell remarked on August 26th that DNA evidence had come back from the crime scene, but he would not give any details about what this could be. Thanks for joining us here in the garage. If you need more True Crime Garage, go to truecrimegarage.com and subscribe to our show called Off the Record. It's a bonus show. It's on Stitcher Premium. You're going to love it. We love it. Thanks for joining us here in the garage. And until tomorrow, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D-printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go.